Greetings from the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our program on Overcoming Challenges, Women in the Military. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs you can view on our YouTube channel. On Friday, April 2nd at noon, we'll hear from George William Van Cleve, author of Making a New American Constitution. In this book, Van Cleve explores flaws in the U.S. Constitution and proposes solutions for them. And on April 6th at noon, Jonathan Petropoulos will tell us about his new book, Gehring's Man in Paris, the story of Bruno Lose, who helped supervise the Nazi systematic theft of thousands of artworks during World War II. Women have fought for our nation from its earliest years, but it took more than a century before women were able to enlist and serve in uniform. America's entry into World War I marked the first time women could serve in roles other than nursing. In the ensuing decades, roles for women in the military expanded. Women achieved officer rank, took on leadership roles, gained access to service academies, and fought for equal footing with men in combat. Tonight's discussion will explore the challenges women in the military have faced, their successes, and the opportunities that lie ahead. Now I'd like to introduce you to our panelists. First Lieutenant Madison Hovren attended the United States Military Academy at West Point where she was part of the women's basketball team. During her time there, the team played in the NCAA tournament and she was named first team all-conference. The summer following her sophomore year, she interned for the San Antonio Spurs and ESPN. Harvard graduated from West Point in 2019 and commissioned as a Signal Corps officer. She is now stationed at Fort Gordon in Augusta, Georgia, where she is serving as a platoon leader in the 442nd Signal Battalion. Kristen K. French is Chief of Staff at the Defense Logistics Agency. From July 2016 to March 2018, French was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and served for 16 months as the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Logistics and Material Readiness. French graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point in 1986 and was commissioned into the regular Army as a Lieutenant in the Quartermaster Corps. She retired from military service as a Brigadier General in November 2015. Her nearly 30 years in uniform included duties in key command and staff positions worldwide and combat deployments in Afghanistan, Kuwait, and Croatia. Heather Wilson became the 11th president of the University of Texas at El Paso in 2019. She graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in the third class to admit women, is a Rhodes Scholar, and earned her master's and doctoral degrees at Oxford University in England. Wilson has also served as the 24th Secretary of the United States Air Force, as a member of Congress for 10 years from New Mexico, and as the president of the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. She is a member of the National Science Board, which oversees the National Science Foundation and chairs the Women in Aviation Advisory Board of the Federal Aviation Administration. Our moderator, Soledad O'Brien, is an award-winning journalist, speaker, author, and philanthropist who anchors and produces the Hearst Television political magazine program, Matter of Fact, with Soledad O'Brien. She reports for HBO Real Sports, PBS NewsHour, and WebMD, and has anchored and reported for NBC, MSNBC, and CNN. She's the author of two books and has won numerous awards, including three Emmys, the George Peabody Award, an Alfred I. DuPont Prize, and the Gracie. Newsweek Magazine named her one of the 15 people who make America great. She is the founder and CEO of Soledad O'Brien Productions and with her husband is the founder of the Powerful Foundation, which helps young women get to and through college. She is also a member of the National Archives Foundation Board. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Soledad O'Brien, and I'm very excited to be moderating this conversation with three truly phenomenal women. Uh, President Heather Wilson, if I may, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in the third class that admitted women. So mm -hmm. looking back on uh, limitations, I guess is the way I'd put it, uh, to women's opportunities, what made you decide at that point that that was the, the right career path for you? 
Well, I grew up in a family of aviators. My grandfather was a flyer in the First World War, and then he came to America in 1922 and was a barnstormer and, and uh, opened little airports around New England. And my dad was uh, was also a pilot and and enlisted in the Air Force, um, and uh, and then when he got out of the Air Force, was a commercial pilot. He also, when he came home, he married my his high school sweetheart, my mom, uh, who was a nurse. And in the 1950s, when a lot of women didn't even drive, he taught my mom to fly. And they rebuilt an aircraft together. And then he built an experimental aircraft inside our house, a little 1,600 square foot house. Um, and so I grew up around airplane parts. And, the, and around aviators. And when they opened the Air Force Academy to women in 1976, I was a junior in high school. And I remember where I was when I saw the news on television. And I thought, you know, I, I was a good student. I loved to do different things. And um, my dad had died when I was young, but my grandfather was still alive. And so here's this man who started out, started flying in the years just after the Wright brothers. And I I went to talk to him about this Air Force Academy thing, and and um, he had flown in the Second World War with uh, in the United States, um, doing bearing parts and things uh, with the Wasps. And he said, "Well, you know, I flew with some women in World War II who were pretty good sticks, so I guess that'd be okay." And so, with with his blessing and a full ride scholarship. I became the first person in my family to go to college, and it was absolutely life-changing for me. So Madison, let's talk about 2019, because that's when you graduated, and I'm curious how you saw it in terms of both opportunities and and also um, hurdles as well, and I really should refer to you as First Lieutenant Madison <laughs> Forgive me. Um, I'm getting all comfortable with my panelists. Um, what was through as you were juggling and thinking about where you wanted to take your next steps? How were you ga gauging what would be an opportunity and, and what might be a challenge? Yeah, so my path was a little bit different getting into the military. I was recruited for basketball, obviously going into West Point. So that initially drew me in. But I honestly was not going to go to West Point at all. I was like, absolutely not. And then we visited and I was just like, this place is so amazing. Like the things they're doing here, the things they're accomplishing, the family atmosphere. I was like, this is for me. And they had great basketball on top of that. So I was like, I can't argue with that. But overall, once I showed up, I was like, the military is just it's what I'm meant to do, I can tell, and there's just so many great opportunities for me here and a chance for me to really thrive as a female leader. Were there any things that you were worried about in part of your absolutely not that were obstacles that you were thinking about as a woman potentially coming into the military? Mm -hmm. um, at first, I didn't really know what to expect, but as I started to research a little bit more, I did learn that women definitely, uh, there's not as many, obviously, in the military, and that definitely was a huge obstacle, especially when I first went to West Point basic training, being with so many guys, there was only two women in my squad, me and one other girl, and the rest were guys, so about eight in our entire platoon, and it was just such an adjustment, but luckily the guys we had around us were super helpful and very supportive, and that really helped the transition, but I definitely think being one of the few women was a huge obstacle, and it's just something you really have to like grow with, and I think it made me stronger overall, and just learning to work through being one of the few women in the room has really helped me to gain my voice and gain my confidence. General Kristen French, now retired, you spent 30 years nearly in uniform. Talk to me a little bit about the efforts to integrate the services to women. What, what worked and, and what do you think still remains to be done to be effective? Okay, thank, first of all, thank you all for having me tonight. I'm, I'm excited to be on this panel. Um, so I listen to what Madison says, said about her experiences, and I think about what, uh, you know, we went through 30 years ago, and, and she said she had two people in her squad that were women, and we only had one in our squads or none, depending on maybe two, two in our entire platoon because there were so few women 
in those days, it was something like 10, under 10 percent women. Now it's up to 20 or 25 percent. So I look at what we had opportunities for when we were graduating from West Point and the other academies versus what is available now. And then what's available in our military across uh, all the different services. And I think about how women can be fighter pilots and women can be on nuclear submarines now, which we couldn't do 30 years ago. And women um, could not be in the combat arms in the army, in, in the infantry and armor uh, branches. Uh, couldn't go to ranger school. There were so many things that weren't available 30 years ago that are available today for women. So the opportunities are, are really um, amazing for for folks that are grad women that are graduating now from uh, college or, or going into uh, the military. Um, there are some things, though, that do need to be uh, considered for the future. I know, uh, like the Marine Corps, um, I work now in a joint environment, so I'm, I work with all services, not just Army. And I know the Marine Corps is working to get some joint integrated training, and they haven't done that all, all around uh, yet. They're still working through that. And I know there's some things that we won't really know about it'll take maybe a decade or more to, to get some of the gains with what we've done so far. For example, in the Army, a couple of the young women that have gone to Ranger School are now in the infantry branch, but they're still captains. They're, they're junior officers. So we're going to have to see in about a decade if they can uh, continue to uh, progress in those branches and, and aspire to do more senior level missions that and positions that hopefully will be available to them. So I think there's still, again, more more to be gained. It's just going to take a little time to see. Heather, I, I pose the same question to you. What obstacles do you think remain, especially if you're talking about both leadership and, and recruitment? Mm. So, so uh, from the very beginning, the Air Force attracted more women than some of the other services, and that, that may be because it was thought of as more technical. Or I'm not, I'm not I really don't know why, but, but um, the uh, the the Air Force also pretty much fully opened all opportunities for women earlier. So, in 1991, the law changed to allow women to fly combat aircraft, and that got women to to you know over 97 percent of the positions in the fields were open to women. So, opportunities were open earlier. I would say that one of the challenges still with young women is encouraging them to pursue the fields in in the Air Corps or in the other services, in the Air Force, the other services, where they're going to be at the center of things, which often means being a pilot, a navigator, a remotely piloted aircraft operator, some logistics, maintenance. So the things that are core to the mission, as opposed to things that are administrative in nature or you know, public affairs officers, those kinds of things, because you need that experience experience in order to have credibility once you get to mid-career. Mm. So, uh, Madison, since you are the most recently recruited, maybe I can sort of pose a version of this to you. Are there ways that you feel that um, recruitment could be better? Uh, uh, you know, where you say it, uh, the military is undermining its own efforts to recruit more, you know, young women like yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm curious about your experience in your recruitment. And what did you think was, you know, again, because you said, oh, absolutely not. Uh, until you got on the campus, I'm curious about like, what was part of that. Absolutely not, because I, I have to imagine that there's a, a number of young women who might say a similar thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, one of my basketball teammates told me that she was like crying and screaming when she, when her dad made her come, and she was like, "Absolutely not," as well. And then she got there, and she's like, "Oh, actually, I like this." So she it was the same way. Her dad forced her to come, and she ended up really liking it. I think it's just the whole not really knowing what you're getting into, the whole army seeming like it might be too tough. I don't, you just don't know what to expect. And your first thought is just like those infantry men out there doing that crazy stuff. And I just feel like there's just so much you don't understand as a woman and so many opportunities that until you're actually there visiting, until you're actually in it, you don't realize that you are capable of doing it. And it is something that, you know, you can make happen. Do you follow that? that Oh, go ahead, Heather. Sorry. I don't think when we recruit, um, I sometimes think that the way in which the services recruit appeals more naturally to boys than to girls. But think about this for a second. If, if you ask everybody who's listening to this today to close your eyes and think about the most protective person in your life, the person who would run into a burning building to save you and protect you from anything, Half the people listening 
are they remembering their moms? We are the very often, the women are natural protectors. And that's what the military is. And we don't capitalize on that enough and that desire to serve and protect when we recruit. And, um, you know, it's all about the cool things you get to use and what you get to fly and where you get to go. And it's not the reason. More girls care about the reason why, um, not just the cool things you get to do. Hmm. That's a great point. And I was actually I'm going to ask you, Madison, if you are there are things that you thought the military could have done in terms of framing where you wouldn't think, oh, it's guys and they're doing crazy things. It's more. I'm a strong woman. I love I love serving my country. Why why not me? I'm I'm curious if you have any sort of just thoughts in terms of what you could, you know, you if you could whisper in someone's ear and give them yeah. advice about recruiting the next generation of women, what you would say. I think well, I think first off, showing like all the different branches would be really helpful. Just knowing that like you don't have to be the one out there on the front line. There's other career opportunities. And obviously just seeing women out there doing it themselves. I mean just seeing other women doing it, you're like, okay, if she's doing it, like, I can do it. But going back to the branches, when you know that infantry is not the only branch, because I didn't know what the branches were probably till my sophomore year. Like, I had no idea. So so if you know that you don't just have to go into combat arms and you can be a support branch, I think that could really help a lot of people out and make them want to join as well. Hmm. Great point. Um, Kristen, I would like to have you start up a conversation about sexual assault because we, we are getting data that it's risen between 2016 and 2018, and it's been a conversation for long before then. Um, talk to me a little bit about what institutional factors you think set the stage for sexual assault and how it's being addressed now, and is it effective? This is definitely a, a topic of conversation in today's military, and, but I would tell you it's been around for years. Uh, you know, we've had sexual harassment and sexual assault for, for decades, well, probably for eternity. And um, I think about 20, 30 years ago and the training we had as uh, young officers and enlisted and what they, uh, the training was for you to confront your, your perpetrator if you were harassed or assaulted, not to go to get help, but to look at um, the person who was doing it, tell them to stop doing it. And we've definitely progressed from that type of environment where people weren't wanting to go forward to their perpetrator and say, you know, that stop doing that to me. So where we are now is, is we've really educated and had training on what to do with regards to sexual assault and sexual harassment. And uh, what's great is we've instituted some programs throughout our military, and we're working not just with um, folks that, you know, you always think it's women who are being harassed or assaulted, it's, it's also men. And so you've got to look at really across the force. So I think, um, you know, we're really providing more support to victims and we're doing some great programs across, um, like I say, across the military. Now I would tell you that um, the age of the military population is causing some of the, uh, you know, the reasons that we're having problems. I mean, they're, they're young people, they're around their peers and around people who they feel that they're comfortable with. And then before you know it, there's a situation that comes up that maybe isn't appropriate. And the folks might not realize that what they're doing is wrong or they know what they're doing is wrong, but they continue to do it. And so we just have to educate folks, continue to train on this t topic. It is a very, very tough topic. And you see what's happened recently with uh, the terrible situation down at Fort Hood where Specialist Guillen uh, was assaulted and then eventually uh, was murdered. And uh, the, the problem is we've got to get at it. And I know our military is trying to find ways to help people understand that this is not acceptable in our military, this isn't acceptable in society. And so I think that, uh, again, it's a tough topic, but we have to keep looking at it and addressing it. The good news story is, I think one of the reasons that there's a higher number is because more people are reporting incidents mm -hmm. because people feel that they're taking act people are taking action when something's happening. And so we've seen a rise as in, in a lot of my organizations I've seen a rise in reporting over the last five years because people are taking action when there's something that is reported. And that's a good news story. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very true, that it can reflect sort of a, an attitude of this is finally uh, something that's going to be taken seriously, so then you can come forward. Um, Heather, when you started your story, you talked about uh, your family, and, and yeah. your story is kind of typical because I think it's like 60% of uh, Army recruits come from military families. You know, you're in it because you know someone who, or your grandfather or your father, and I'm curious if that has issues ultimately because i think mm -hmm. you know half of its enlisted population is recruited from 10 percent of the nation's high schools um you know is it is it too narrow does it and you know i i i would guess if i walked out into the street and started polling people there's a whole bunch of americans who don't know anybody who serves yeah. in the military and i always have found that very troubling that if you're either a military family or you don't know anybody at all Mm. It troubles me too, and it's about half in the Air Force. Um, when you say, "Is there, you know, your mother, father, grand grandfather, grandmother served in the military?" So it's a similar and similar in the Air Force. But you think about this: during World War II, one in ten Americans served in uniform. One in ten. So the average household size means that every third house on the block had a had a blue star in the window. Today, it's less than two in a thousand. So the military is much smaller, even though we continue to be a superpower, and we're able to to uh, to to have enough people in the military through an all volunteer service. And I strongly support the all volunteer service. What it does mean that there that that uh, you know it's not only the fathers and grandfathers who uh, didn't have the draft now, we've now got kids who, who don't, are three generations removed from anyone in their family even being subject to the draft. So it's not just that they don't serve, it's that they know they would never have to serve. And I'm not sure that that's really good for our country because it does create a gap between the protected and the protectors. Um, but it's also a consequence of the fact we're able to protect our country with only two of a thousand people in uniform. What do you think, and maybe Kristen will ask this of you, um, is getting in the way of appealing to more women? If you look at the number of people of color, actually the military has done incredibly well among Hispanics, African Americans, um, those numbers and that outreach has been very intentional and is very good. And then you look at women and you're like, mm, it's only okay, improving certainly, but 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 clearly they're having a lot of success on one hand uh, and, and less on the other. Maybe you can start me off, Kristen, and then Madison, I'll have you jump in as well. The part of it is the recruiting that we talked about earlier. I mean, we, we don't have a targeted audience with women. It's more recruiting just uh, during football games, you'll see a lot of recruiting during sporting events, and they don't target all um, Americans. They target mostly young men. But also, uh, I think it's a little bit of the, the societal norms. People, a lot of women don't even think about joining the military. It's kind of like what Heather's saying. People don't even know about the military, so they don't think about uh, serving our, their country is in uniform. Um, I think it's also the... Uh, nervousness of work-life balance. I mean, that's a big discussion that um, people have of how we can serve and then have a family and do some of the things that Heather was saying about uh, protecting our family and being mothers. Uh, so it's it, there's multiple reasons, but I would tell you that uh, we, we just, it's just unfortunate, but we just don't have uh, a lot of women thinking of going into the military. And uh, you know, the opportunities are so great, but they don't see it. They see a lot of the infantry and the, you know, the submarines and the aircraft carriers and that. So it's a, little, a lot of different things that is just causing us to not have women join. Madison, I assume you'd agree with that. Uh, were those things that were your concerns? Did you think, okay, well, what, what would my career be? What would I be doing? And how would I balance a, a family and a life uh, if, in fact, I go ahead and do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were definitely some of my concerns. And like I said, I just didn't know what it looked like fully because I just feel like nobody ever really explained to me what to expect or that it wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be and that it wasn't all just infantry. And I feel like a lot of people just target, like you said, to the men and to the young boys because it's just such an easy target. You're like, oh, they're the ones who are going to want to do it anyways. Like, we don't even need to bother with the young girls. But then 
there could be so many young girls that would want to do it, given the opportunity, if they had the knowledge on what they could be getting themselves into, the benefits, the opportunities, and just I feel like they miss out on that opportunity. Sounds like uh, the armed services need to rethink marketing 101 uh, and, and who their ultimate uh, you know, client could be or the person they're trying to reach could be. For Kristen and Heather, I'm curious um, how you think your military experience would be different if there hadn't been restrictions um, that existed when you guys were first starting. Like, Do you look back wistfully and say, oh, if I could have all that Madison has open and available to her. Here's here's how I think um, it could have gone. Why don't you start us off, Heather, and then Kristen, I'll have you weigh in. Well, um, I actually made a decision to do something different after graduate school. I was I had a slot to go to pilot training, but at the time, you know, when I closed my eyes and thought about flying, it was something small, fast with one seat, and uh, uh, that wasn't that wasn't open at the time. I went on to have a wonderful. A wonderful experience uh, in the Air Force and I have no regrets. Um, I fly a little airplane and I actually now have, as a secretary of the Air Force, flew in some aircraft, all kinds of different aircraft. And I have to say, I, I really like my little Cessna 152 better than I like being strapped in and, you know, masked up and everything else. Uh, you can go faster in an F-16, but I can see more in my Cessna, so it's not a big deal. How about you for you, Kristen? Yeah. I, uh, I have a little story that when I was a cadet, I went to flight school for trainer uh, opportunity and I enjoyed it, but I, it was helicopters, not planes or, or, or the big aircraft the Air Force has, but uh, I enjoyed it. But again, it wasn't an opportunity that uh, I could go and fight in a, in a combat helicopter on the front lines. It would be more of a supply helicopter. So I, um, I did some other opportunities and found that I really enjoyed logistics and I ended up uh, um, you know, following that path. And I would tell you that it doesn't mean I wasn't able to do everything I wanted. I deployed to Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Croatia, I mean, all over the place. I also commanded at all levels and I was in divisional units. I was right there with all of the uh, maneuver forces the whole time. And uh, so I think that it's it's not that we didn't have opportunities. They were just different opportunities, but we still were able to, I was able to continue to get promoted and progress up the chain. Now, yes, Madison will have more opportunities because uh, a lot of times at the senior levels, uh, they don't have a lot of women uh, opportunities and things like the chief of staff of the Army, chief of staff of the Air Force, but it could happen in the future and it could happen for the young officers and young enlisted now that they could go go all the way up to the senior ranks. So um, I didn't look at it as not having an opportunity, just different opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, Madison, I'm going to ask you the next question in a moment. I just wanted to remind anybody who's listening, if you uh, have a question for any of our panelists, you're welcome to uh, submit it. You're watching this on YouTube, so feel free, and I'll get to your questions in, in just a little bit. I'm going to continue to moderate this conversation, but I'll switch to audience questions in just a moment. So, Madison, my question for you, you mentioned that you were sometimes felt like one of, one of the few <laughs> um, women. Talk to me a little bit about your mentors. Um, did that mean that you had all male mentors? Was there an effort to give you female mentors? Were there just an abundance of female mentors? Talk to me a little bit about navigating that. Yeah, I feel like I definitely had a few of both, some male, some female. A lot definitely came from older players on my basketball teams. They were great mentors because they had been through it and they were able to teach me so much. My basketball coaches were huge mentors to me. I went to them for so much and they really helped me through things on the court, off the court. And then I also had officer mentors that were able to help me on the more officer and military side. So it was really great to have mentors in different areas that, you know, had different knowledges on different areas, basically, that allowed me to go to different people. And yeah, I'm really grateful for that. It sounds like it was very intentional and structured that way, meaning if you're not a basketball phenom, you wouldn't sort of be out of luck because you don't yeah. have any basketball coaches to mentor you. Yeah, exactly. Like everybody had activities or sports that they could do. So they were able to find some mentors either within that or with different activities. So it was definitely structured in a way that people were able to seek out mentors. Great. Uh, for Kristen and for Heather, why do you think women leave the military? Do you think it's mm -hmm. kind of a, a reason that, you know, women would talk about leaving any job? You know, it's, it's work-life balance becomes very difficult. Is it 
the discrimination? Is it an exhaustion about being one of the few? Um, why don't you start for me, Kristen, and then Heather, I'll have you jump in at the end of that. Sure. Well, first of all, what Madison just said about mentors, complete opposite for uh, women mentors for some of us that are a bit older. We did not have the women mentors. I did not have the women mentors when I was uh, growing up in the military. I um, had a lot of great mentors, but they were male mentors. Uh, I think back about how few women I saw who were senior to me that had children and were still balancing their military career with their uh, family. I also uh, would tell you when I was uh, in a Fourth Infantry Division, I was the only female lieutenant colonel in the entire division, and there were no women above me in rank. So it just shows you how we, there weren't a lot of women uh, at the senior levels that you could go to and ask for advice and support. So um, I did have a lot, though, of other mentors who gave me great advice. So um, I think getting out of the military, you know, people people were looking at the, they look at work-life balance. They look at, um, you know, what opportunities they have uh, to get promoted and continue to serve in senior levels. Um, so there's, there's a lot of reasons that people decide that, uh, Maybe the military is not for them, but I would tell you that uh, the, the mentorship piece is so critical to have mm -hmm. people who can tell you how to balance what you're going through and, and be successful. Uh, and before uh, you jump in, Heather, I wanted to go back uh, to Madison for a moment, because when you were describing your coaches, I assumed you were talking about women. Am I right? For Madison. Sorry, you cut out a little bit there. Can oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. Oh, um, no worries. Uh, well, you were talking about your, your uh, coaches and some of your mentors. I assumed you were listing off those were women. Am I, am I making the correct assumption? So we had multiple uh, male coaches and multiple female coaches, and I definitely feel like I was mentored by all of them. Obviously, in different ways, they had different personalities, but I really feel like all of them gave me something that helped me to grow as a player and a leader on and off the court. Perfect. That's what I wanted to clarify. Uh, so, um, Heather, why don't you walk me through what you think are the reasons um, that women depart? Is it mentoring? Is it just a lot to balance? Uh, certainly for the Air Force, the number one reason that we were losing people from the Air Force, particularly pilots who had a lot of options, um, very highly trained, a lot of options outside of the service, men and women, was the operational pace. And you think about this, the Air Force went to war in 1990 when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and they've never come home. 30 continuous years, uh, yeah, 30, now 31 continuous years of combat operations and very high levels of deployment rates, and it just doesn't stop. And at some point, families are trying to, you know, they're, they it, it's the birthday factor, right? I've missed another birthday. I've missed another anniversary. Um, and that balance becomes very, very difficult to justify. And these are very highly trained people, and they're very much in demand. And so so um, they have options. And so, so recruiting and keeping talent is one of the keys for the future of all the services. I said I was going to go to questions in a moment, but actually there's a question exactly about this. So I'm going to jump in and break what I just said and go to it because I'm curious about how that is changing. Um, the question is how things change for women in the military who struggle with balancing family life, pregnancy, military, housing. Uh, what you're describing, uh, I could see that being a complete deal breaker, not just for women, but maybe for, for anybody. Mm. What, what is the military doing overall then to deal with things like that that um, are really about balancing you know, life and a family um, and not feeling like you're, you're stuck? I, I I'd like to... Oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Kristen. I was going to say, uh, I'd like to start out by saying that um, I had my son, and eight months later, I deployed to Kuwait. And uh, they're changing the rules now with um, maternity leave and paternity. They're even providing paternity leave uh, or second caregiver leave. So they're making the Army and the services, I should say all the services, are changing some of their policies because of the struggles that they've seen of, of people who have either left the military or decided it wasn't for them after one or two tours because they're trying to balance, you know, what's happening in their personal life with what's happening in their professional life. So, for example, it used to be six weeks um, for a, a mom to have 
uh, maternity leave and then go back to work. And now it's uh, over 12, 12 weeks they get. And then a, a secondary child for paternity leave, you get two to three weeks. So they're making the, the services are making uh, changes so that people can bounce. They're also looking at high school stabilization where they allow people to stay at a duty station when their child is a high school senior. So there's a, there's a lot of things that I think they've, the, the military has looked at to help families, help women, help people who want to balance that personal and professional. But it's absolutely a, uh, it's, it's something that we're seeing even in society right now with uh, telework and women who are at home and trying to balance their, their children going to school uh, virtually and them doing their job at home. And it, it is a tough balance. So I think that Really, that's what you see a lot with uh, with women getting out is they just have a hard time balancing, you know, uh, what what they want personally and professionally. Heather, I would I'm say sorry. I would say just to add to that, uh, the in my time as the secretary, the chief and I really worked to reduce the operating tempo to give more white space on people's calendars so that it wasn't just back to back to back deployments. And I think the other one that was probably one of the biggest changes um, that to help people in the military was to change the way we do assignments. So it's a lot more like medical school where there's like this, this, you know, matching algorithm to try to, it doesn't try to get more people what they really want, no matter what their reason is to want that, you know, whether it's a, a joint assignment with your spouse, or I'm trying to get closer to grandparents, or this is what I want for the next piece of my career. So I uh, give people a lot more input on rather than just, you know, somebody down at Randolph Air Force Base who has your life in their hands, you know. I know one more thing about assignments and that we haven't touched on this yet, and it's the Gardner Reserve. Um, uh, the National Guard and the Reserve are a significant part of our military, and it helps to address some of the issues on, on how do you make work-life balance work, because it doesn't require the constant permanent change of station moves. Um, my husband was in the Guard after he was on active duty and had a really satisfying career as uh, uh, doing pulling guard duty a couple of weeks in the summer and a month every you know weekend every month and it was it was very satisfying a lot of women women should think about that opportunity too I, I do want to bring up one other thing since she mentioned her husband is um, having a support structure when you're in the military because you can be called on a short notice deployment you can be called to go to the field and do some training and if you have a family you've got to have a support structure and you know I had my husband I had my parents I know that um, other people have relatives or friends. And um, so if you are single in the military, uh, and a lot of women who, like I said, I followed were single women and never married or never had children because that was kind of the old school way of being in the military. But now you see a lot of women with families and you've got to have a support structure. And, and it's tough because uh, sometimes they don't live near you. And you've got to find a way to make it happen. But uh, our military is is not, um, you know, is not a telework army, Air Force, Navy, or Marine Corps. They have to be at work. So it is a it is a something you've got to balance. Ma Madison, as the most recent grad, I'm curious as you hear these conversations, are these things that you think about as you plot out the next steps of your career? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I mean. I still have a little bit more time uh, in my current job, but I'm obviously always looking to hear advice for further in my career and how I can improve. And especially maybe when I get older and do want to have my own family, taking uh, advice like that and really applying it because I know they have so much experience. So it's really important to me to listen to what they have to what they have to say. Great. Well, you know what? Maybe I will hit them both up then to give you some advice. I'd be curious. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, and, you know, give me, um, sometimes mentoring sessions can last five hours, but give me the, the couple of thoughts for Madison as she navigates her, her steps, kind of as a, a fledgling, as a recent graduate. Um, what would you advise her? What, do you, what would she, she be thinking about? How would you talk to her about, you know, not just the years ahead, but the, the decades ahead if she wants to stay in the military. Um, Heather, why don't you start for me, and then Kristen, I'll have sure. So when I was your age, Madison, I was really focused on the job. Just, you know, just do really, really well at the job I had. And I 
And but when I look back on the things that I was able to accomplish, the thing that I remember are the people who were there with me. And what endures over time are the relationships of trust you build through the work. And those, it's almost like investing with compound returns. Because over time, that friends and those friends and those, the network that you've built will help you along the way. And they'll also, um, uh, you'll also be helping them as you rise in the military or in a broader profession. So steward and build relationships of trust and don't just do the work. I like that. Thank you. Absolutely. And I, I'd say, yes, friends are so critical in the military and, and your buddies that you work alongside are uh, everlasting friends. So I would tell you also is uh, take advantage of what all the military has to offer. Uh, everything from travel to schools, what Heather mentioned about maybe taking a break from your, um, you know, your, your duties as a officer on the front lines to go to a class or a school and maybe get a second degree, um, look for opportunities to uh, have other leadership roles and, and take on some challenging jobs. Because if you get outside your comfort zone, you'll learn some new things and you'll, uh, you know, that'll all be added to your kit bag for the future. And so I tell you, the military, what, what an opportunity to, to see the world and uh, visit some great places and meet some great people and, and just ex explore. It's, uh, as, a, it's as an institution, you know, Kristen, I, I, I don't know about you when you were a lieutenant, but I looked at what my friends from high school were doing right out of college. <laughs> you get more responsibility as a young person in the military than any other profession. And maybe it takes a little bit longer to rise in that institution. It's not like you're going to be CEO in five years of your own company or something, but you get a lot of responsibility for, for other people and equipment and getting a mission done. It's, um, it's nothing like it. I, I can't think of another profession where you get that much responsibility as a, at a young age. Sounds like a very effective marketing tool for the military as they, as they open up the conversation to young women, right? I mean, this idea of lots of responsibility and lots of opportunity at a young age is a yeah. great part of the conversation. I want to turn our conversation to some of the questions we've been getting from our audience. So big thank you to the audience. Um, this one is, uh, should women be made to register for selective service? Madison, I'm going to have you answer that one first. What do you say? <laughs> Uh, personally, I don't think they should have to because I think that so many women can excel and do well in the military, but I think if we want to increase our female population, it needs to be something they want to do and not something people are forced to do. We need to show them it's something that they have so many opportunities in and something that they would enjoy rather than something they're forced to do. So I think to increase female pop population, they need to know it's something that they truly want to do. Kristen, how about you? So I'm, I'm opposite opinion on that. I believe that, uh, and I know this is a big discussion in Congress right now, and they're just talking about if they should make it mandatory for women. I, I believe that if uh, men have to, uh, you know, register for selected service, women should too. I know other countries do that, uh, you know, Germany, Israel, other other places I've been assigned or visited. They, uh, they make uh, both men and women's um, sign up and, and some of them have mandatory service. And I think that if women want to do the same roles and be in the same responsibility level of men, that they should also, you know, register for selective service. That's, that's just my personal opinion. How about you, Heather? Uh, I, as I mentioned before, I don't think that we need a draft, but the question is about registering for the se selective service. Right. I actually think our selective service system is pretty outdated. I mean, the idea that at 18 you go down to the post office and fill out a postcard that goes in some database somewhere and that otherwise the government's not going to be able to find you. I mean, you know, come on. If we, if we had to go back to a circumstance where we needed people to defend this country, we better take the best. And some of the best are women and everybody should be subject to serve in a kind of national crisis like that. And you don't have to fill out the postcard. <laughs> it is a little antiquated, I agree. I had sort of forgotten that that is the way, right? Um, uh, this next question. My husband and I sponsor Naval Academy midshipmen and women. What additional support slash guidance do our panelists wish they had when in military college or before going into the field? Why don't you start uh, for us, because you're up on my screen. Heather, why don't you kick us off? Well, first of all, thank you for sponsoring midshipmen. It means that you're, you're buying 
habits at Costco have really changed, you know, several <laughs> gallons of milk every weekend or something. Um, um, I would I, I encourage them to continue to develop and grow. One of the things that will be different, Madison, for your generation, you know, we, we went through school, we got our bachelor's degree at some point, maybe we got a master's degree, we went to school or, you know, some specialty school. But more, more today than 30 years ago, there will be a continuous spiral of very rapid development and learning. And so for, for young people today, that commitment to continuous learning has got to be just part of their DNA. Um, and if they don't like it, and they're just looking forward to graduation and closing the books. I got news. It's not going to end. Um, the only difference will be the answers are not in the back of the book. I would tell you, too, that uh, with social media today, there's a lot of <clears throat> information out there, but it's not all correct information. So it's really important to get to know folks who are in uh, the same environment. So if you, you know, if you're in a military college, you should be looking for folks who are either instructors there or uh, people who have served recently who could help you with understanding how to navigate uh, and I, in the future. And I definitely agree that, that the social media is, um, you know, it's, it's so much information. And like we said, things are changing so rapidly, like Heather's mentioned, that uh, you've got to keep up with it. And it's important to, uh, you know, to talk to folks and understand what you to expect when you get out of college and then what to, you know, look for when you're out uh, doing, doing your service to your nation. And how about for you, Madison? What do you wish um, that somebody, advice that somebody had given you or support and guidance that someone had given you? I think some of the guidance I wish I had been given would be to maybe do my own research into what the big army is like and then also really focus on the military training and like because that's a lot of what you do when you get to the real army and I feel like I spent a lot of time when I first got to the big army learning more about like what it is the army actually does and what my job will be because not that I didn't take it seriously but I wasn't as focused on like learning about what I'm going to do because I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out when I get there. So I think just looking ahead to what your job is going to be and looking ahead to like what to expect so you prepare yourself in advance instead of jumping in and trying to learn things in the moment. I have one final question that I'd like each of you to answer for me, and that is um, what's the one thing that you think the military could do today that would literally and tangibly grow the numbers and the appeal of women into the military. And, and since you're up on my screen, Madison, we'll start with you. We know the, of the list of things that we've talked about, some of them, what, what specific thing could you see happening that you think would really move the needle on growing the number of women and making women feel like they're not the one of a few, uh, you know, per class? Um, I've kind of touched on this already, but I think just changing the stigma that it's not just guys out there doing crazy stuff and that crazy stuff like frontline is the only option when you join the military. So just also changing the stigma about women in the military, because I know some people still don't have the best opinion on it. So just realizing that women are capable, they can do a lot of great things in the military, but at the same time, they're supporting roles and other opportunities if that's not exactly what they're looking for. And just changing the stigma that women are capable and it's something that they can definitely excel at. For Kristen and Heather, um, since you guys have been in it for a minute, uh, as you look back on your careers, I'm curious both of those things. One, what specific thing could start to, starting tomorrow could make a change? But also, do you look back and see tremendous change? Do you feel good about all the changes from when you were in until you know where Madison is right now? And, and Kristen, why don't you start off for me? And then Heather, I'll give you the last word. Okay, so first of all, uh, I think forums like this opportunities to show during Women's History Month and then during uh, just throughout the year ways that women have done great things in our military and having examples. And I know there's a lot of opportunities to have young women and then women who are uh, at the end of their military careers come back and explain about what they've done to showcase, go to high schools, go to colleges, just just put the word out and advertising on different TV shows because you don't you don't see it enough. And uh, I think that's that's will help us with getting more people interested in potentially serving. Um, 
And uh, I would tell you that, uh, I guess, let me ask, tell me again what your second question I was. was. Curious, <laughs> as, you, as you look backwards, do you feel like, oh, yes. wow, there, there's been so much change and I feel really good about that change? Or do you feel like, wow, it's moved at a snail's pace and, I, you know, it should have been faster? Oh, I thank you for that. I, uh, I would tell you that um, I think that over the last decade, it's really moved fast. I, I think it wasn't moving as fast in the before that. I mean, we were kind of stuck in the 80s, as they say. Um, but over the last decade, I can see a lot of change. I mean, I've mentioned it to you. We've had uh, everything from women uh, being able to serve in different roles that they couldn't serve a decade ago, women uh, getting selected for higher levels of uh, you know, service. We had our first four-star in the Army uh, over the last decade, and the Air Force has had several women four-stars. Um, and then, and the Navy's had one. So uh, a lot has happened over the last 10 years. And it's, it's, it's because our environment, we change so quickly nowadays versus maybe 20, 30 years ago. But I've, I, I would tell you, I've, I enjoyed my service and I would have had it another way. And I look at, uh, you know, the generation before me and how they were, you had even less opportunity. So I think the generation after me is going to have even more. It's, a, it's exciting times for, for Madison and all the young, young folks who are joining our military. Heather, I'm going to give you the final word this evening before we wrap up our panel. Well, I think the biggest change that the Air Force could make or the country could make is that the Air Force is too small for what the nation is asking it to do. And it's burning out our people. And that's why they're choosing to leave. And so, so we need to either reduce the requirements for air power by saying there's some things that we do not have enough forces to do or to make to increase the number of squadrons. And so, so right-sizing the Air Force is, is what would make the biggest difference. From, uh, as far as change goes, in, in, uh, uh, since I graduated from the, the academy in 1982, when I became the Secretary of the Air Force, so I'm the fourth woman to be Secretary of the Air Force. The, the, by the way, the Army and the Navy still haven't had one, but I'm the, I'm the, the fourth uh, uh, woman, and my successor was also a woman. And, um, but when I was going through the, the kind of charm school to get ready for confirmation hearings, I met with senior officers, and they were briefing me on things and, you know, trying to fill my head with facts so that I wouldn't screw up in front of Congress. And, and uh, there was this one briefing where they were, you know, there, were, there was this group of senior officers answering questions and so forth. And we got to the end of this 45-minute briefing and something, and I'm, you know, trying to be professional and all that. And I, I just said, okay, break, break. I said, um, I just want to that um, this is the first time in my life I have, there were, you know, six or seven general officers in this room. This is the first time in my life I've ever been in a room with three three-star women generals. I've never seen this before. I just want to let you know that I think it's really cool. And, um, and they, and what was also really cool was they hadn't noticed it. Hmm. It was just the way it was. They were the best people for the job. And um, it was pretty neat. That truly is, I think, a sign of real progress, right? When someone points out something that's very transformational and everyone's like, we didn't even notice because yeah. it's, become, uh, it's become typical. Great story, a great way to end our panel. Thank you so much to our three panelists, our first Lieutenant Madison Holden, uh, General Retired Christian French, and President Heather Wilson. Thank you to the three of you for joining Thank us you. this evening. Truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.